Okay, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, wa salatu wa salamu ala ashraf al-anbiya wa al-mursaleen, Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een. Assalamu uh, alaykum azdiqai, ma'akum zameelkum Muhammad Abedat, and today inshaAllah we will be discussing the fifth lecture in our pharmacology subject, which is about sedatives, hypnotics, and anxiolytics. Alright, so let's start with some definitions. Uh, to sedate a patient means to calm a patient down. So, كلمة uh, sedate معناها تهدي أو أنك تهدئ حدا أو تهدي يعني. So when we say sedatives, we're talking about drugs that are supposed to induce calm or sleepiness. اللي هي drugs that are supposed to make a patient calm. بيكون معصب بتخلي هادي ومروق. فهاي اللي إحنا بنسميها الأدوية المهدئات. Then when we talk about hypnosis, uh, hypnosis, uh, I'm sure most of us know, something we see in magic shows a lot, but in medical terms, it's completely different. Hypnosis is just inducing sleep. When we talk about hypnotics, these are drugs that induce sleep. So uh, let's move on. Then we have anxiety. So anxiety is an unpleasant state of worry, fear, and nervousness. This is something that most of us uh, are familiar with. القلق, التوتر, الخوف. We all know what anxiety is. We've all been anxious at some point. Uh, so what are anxiolytic drugs, which is you know the title of this lecture? So the first part of the word, which is anxio, comes from anxiety, اللي هو القلق أو التوتر. And the second part of the word, which is lytic, الجاي من lysis, which is destruction or dissolution. Anxio means anxiety, lytic means destroying, and so anxiolytic drugs are anxiety destroying drugs. So before we get into the details, let's first of all uh, talk about human emotions. So there's a very wide range of human emotions. We have happy, we sad, excited, bored, inspired, all of these are emotions, right? ولكن in today's lecture we will be focusing on emotions that specifically are related to degrees of activity. So uh, you and me right now we're watching a lecture. Nothing interesting is going on. We are normal. Our emotional state is normal. We're not agitated. فيعني حركتنا مش بزيادة. And we are not overly sedated and calm. يعني مش بنكون هادين ومروقين. لا we are normal. Our degree of activity is at baseline. Now, when there is an increase in activity uh, in patients from the normal point, now we start to enter into some emotional states like fear and anxiety. And this is something we're familiar with because when a patient is fearful or anxious, when they're afraid or scared, you can very clearly see that there is an increase in their activity. So they start shaking, for example. This is an example of activity. Uh, they start trembling, their hands start shaking, uh, their legs start moving, they start playing with their hair, they start fidgeting with things like pens and pencils. And so all of these things are signs of agitation, signs of an increase in activity. And this is what fear and anxiety look like. You can already see what it looks like. And uh, yeah. So what is fear? Fear is mostly normal. Most of us have been afraid at some point. Most of us are afraid, you know, on a daily basis. We have certain things that scare us, right? Uh, it's usually an emotional reaction to perceived danger. We think that there is something dangerous that is uh, coming close to us and we get scared because of it, you know? There's multiple things that can scare us. For example, uh, going into a difficult exam can be very scary, you know, because this is an important exam. Maybe we don't feel that we studied enough. So this can be scary. And also seeing a wild animal like a bear, for example, this is an actual danger to our lives. So yeah, that's, that's pretty scary. So fear generally is normal, provided there is a good reason behind it. Tamam? Okay, so what is anxiety? So you can think of anxiety as being a lower degree of fear. So he is خوف ولكن أقل منها بشوي. لأنه we have almost the same signs and symptoms. ولكن it's not as aggravated or it's not as excited as fear. لأنه بالفير we have a lot of increase in activity. We can see the patient is very very scared. بينما الانxiety اللي هي بتكون شوية قلق توتر tension. زي مثلا ال ال الست اللي هون على اليمين. We can see she's very clearly anxious. She's holding her head. She's wrinkling her forehead. There's very clear signs of anxiety. So anxiety in general could be normal or abnormal. There is a lot of things on a daily basis that make us anxious and that's okay. Well, I can, sometimes it can be abnormal. Sometimes there is no reason behind the anxiety and we're just anxious for no reason. And uh, sometimes we're anxious over very little things. So anxiety, again, it could be normal or it could be abnormal. 
Anxiety can be defined as an unpleasant state of nervous behavior and mental occupation. So nervous behavior means that we can clearly see the patient is exhibiting uh, behavior like for example twitching or trembling or fidgeting, sweating, and mental occupation patient about a very specific thing that is the cause of anxiety. For example, if a patient is anxious about going into an exam, then this is the only thing they're going to be thinking about. Or if they're anxious about uh, going into a job interview, that's the same thing. The job interview is the only thing they will be thinking about. So this is called mental occupation. How can we tell the difference? Uh, in order to tell the difference between fear and anxiety, or to tell the difference between normal anxiety and abnormal anxiety, it's important to ask a couple of questions. First of all, is there a good reason behind the symptoms? So is, can the patient provide a good reason, right? Uh, for example, they tell you, I have an exam coming up. Or for example, I saw a wild dog in the street. All of these are things that can induce fear and they're completely normal. If there is a good reason, then it's probably fear or normal anxiety. Tamam? However, is there no reason at all? This means that the patient can provide no reasons whatsoever. They, they don't even know why they're anxious. Or is the reason really small or really far away? For example, they're anxious about a very, very, very tiny thing. For example, the patient is anxious about getting some very dangerous disease because they haven't washed their hands after going out. So this is again, you know, being anxious over a small thing or something that's really far away. For example, this is an, uh, something the doctor mentioned, uh, a second year medical student being anxious about their residency, for example. Now, this is very far away. You don't have to be very anxious about it. So. If there is no reason at all, or the reason is very small or very far away, then this is probably abnormal anxiety. And this is something that has to be discussed with the physician in order to uh, devise the correct treatment plan. Here are the signs and symptoms of fear and anxiety. And looking at this picture, we can very clearly see why fear and anxiety are called uh, or designated as increased activity states. Because we can very clearly see that most of these symptoms have an increase in activity. For example, over here, let me just turn on my, uh, my pointer. We have mind racing. This is one thing. The patient is thinking very, very heavily about a specific thing. This is an increase in activity. Or it could be heart racing and palpitations. This is an increase in activity. Or it can be trembling. This is an increase in activity. Or it can be sweating and shivering. Again, wanting to run. Restlessness. All of these are signs and symptoms of an increase in activity that we see in patients with fear and anxiety. So this is why we say that there is an increase in activity. So, uh, going back to the degrees of activity and agitation, we talked about an increase in activity, fear and anxiety. Now, when there is a decrease in activity or agitation, the patient normal, and we decrease the level of activity, now we go into a state called calm or sedation. The patient normal, activity they are very clearly calm. Their degree of activity decreases significantly. And this is something that can be accomplished with drugs, as we will see later. If we further decrease the level of activity from the calm state, if we the decrease in activity, we'll the of sleep or hypnosis. Now the patient is going to fall asleep. The, uh, as you can see, we are moving down degrees of activity. Or she couldn't normal, but then suddenly calm and sedated, and now we are completely asleep. And if we even further decrease the level of activity, we are going to move into surgical anesthesia, اللي هو التخدير الجراحي. ولما يكون البيشنت مخدر تخدير عام يعني general anesthesia, the patient will not feel anything. They will not respond to anything. They will be completely paralyzed. For this is, I guess you could say, the lowest degree of activity. If we further decrease the level of activity from surgical anesthesia, now the patient will die. We will enter into the death stage. تمام? So further decrease in activity beyond surgical anesthesia leads to death, as we just said. 
Uh, here we have a very nice chart that I took from the doctor's slides that explains what we just took. So here we have the normal state, you know, uh, levels of activity are normal or baseline. If we increase the activity, we go into anxiety or fear. If we decrease the activity, we go into calm or sedation, as you can see. However, in the calm or sedation, there is no motor impairment or cognitive impairment. So the patient can still move. And let's say they can still answer questions, they can still respond to commands. Well, I can, uh, they're just, just calm. They're not moving as much as they used to when they were normal. If we continue to the sleep or hypnosis stage, now we are even less active. Now the patient is going to have, you know, they're going to be paralyzed when they're asleep, especially in the REM stage. It's nice to know. And uh, in terms of cognitive impairment, I don't think you can the patient if you applied some aggravated stimulus. تمام? So if you finally touch the patient, they're not going to respond. Well, I can, if you use a very heavy stimulus, like if you slap the patient, they're going to wake up. Uh, then we move to surgical anesthesia, which is the final stage before death. And this is where we have the lowest degree of activity. Uh, there is no pain, there is complete muscle relaxation, so the patient will be paralyzed and you can only remove the patient from surgical anesthesia by removing the drug that's causing the anesthesia. You can't wake the patient by simply slapping them or you know pouring cold water over them. Uh, and of course the last stage over here we have is death. Now uh, if a drug is able to move a patient down from a stage of anxiety over here down to a normal state, it's called an anxiolytic drug. Tamam? Anxio meaning anxiety and lytic meaning destroying. So they are destroying anxiety by bringing down the patient from a stage of anxiety to a normal state. Now, if a patient has a drug that takes them from the normal state to a calm or sedated state, this is called a sedative, something we've already discussed. Then, if a patient takes a drug that takes them from the normal state to the sleep or hypnosis state, then this is called hypnotic. It's a drug that induces sleep. And if a patient takes a drug that takes them from the normal state over here all the way to surgical anesthesia, then this is called a anesthetic, general anesthetic. So, sedatives, hypnotics, and anxiolytics, are they really different? Are these drugs really separate classes? Why are we taking them as separate? Well, these three classes of drugs are actually the same. So they are all one kind of drug. The way we call a drug sedative, hypnotic, or anxiolytic depends on the use. What I'm trying to say here is that the drugs we're going to take now, all of these drugs, they can work as sedatives, they can work as hypnotics, and they can work as anxiolytics. All these drugs can work any one of these three. Uh, it, it all depends on the use, on how you're using the drug. So all of these drugs, whether it's a sedative or a hypnotic or an anxiolytic, no matter what you want to call it, يعني, they all share one common effect in that they inhibit or depress the central nervous system. Now, just like we saw, the common theme in this lecture was the degrees of activity. All of these drugs, sedatives, hypnotics, anxiolytics, they move the patient down from a higher level of activity to a lower level of activity. And in order to do that, they need to inhibit the central nervous system or depress the central nervous system. فعشان هيك كل هاي الكلاسز سواء sedative أو hypnotic أو anxiolytic كلهم نفس الإشي they are just different names for the same drug ولكن we use these different names in order just to classify the use يعني أنا هل بستخدم هذا الدواء عشان أنوم البيشنت ولا بستخدم عشان أرخي ولا بستخدم عشان أعمل له anxiolysis بس هاي هي الفكرة ولا هو كل نفس على these three classes are the same and uh, there is a dose-dependent relationship in these drugs, زي ما احنا شايفين هون. Dose-dependent means, زي ما حكينا, إنه any one of these drugs that we're going to take later can be used as a sedative or a hypnotic or an anxiolytic, depending on the dose that you give the patient. فزي ما احنا شايفين هون, as we increase the dose, any drug, أي واحدة من الأدوية, كل ما زدنا الدوس تبعها, كل ما زادت قوتها وتأثيرها, فهذا بتتحول من sedative لا hypnotic لا anesthetic. So here we can see there is an increase in the dose and we are moving down the levels of activity. So how do these drugs work? Uh, we're going to get into the exact mechanism now. 
Uh, anxiety is an increased activity in the central nervous system, something that we're already aware of, say, shufna, when there is an increase in activity of the patient, akid, the central nervous system is working and firing much higher than normal. So if we want to treat anxiety, we have to reduce this level of activity in the central nervous system. We have to decrease the CNS activity. Now, we already know in, uh, in the neurons of our body, everywhere, we have excitatory and inhibitory signals. Tamam? We have some excitatory neurotransmitters like acetylcholine, for example. And we also have inhibitory neurotransmitters such as GABA. Tamam? In order for us to depress the central nervous system and uh, treat these conditions of anxiety, for example, we need to use a drug that stimulates inhibitory pathways. Stimulates inhibitory pathways. ليش؟ لأنه we want to inhibit the central nervous system عشان ننزل ال patient من ال high level of activity to a low level of activity. طيب, what are these specific inhibitory pathways that we are going to stimulate؟ خلينا نشوف. Specifically, all of the drugs that we're going to talk about now are going to work on GABA transmission. So GABA is a very common neurotransmitter. It's the major inhibitory neurotransmitter of the central nervous system. The full name is gamma amino butyric acid. And uh, this GABA binds to GABA receptors. Now there are two types of GABA receptors. There is GABA A receptors and there is GABA B receptors. GABA A receptors are what we call ionotropic. And ionotropic receptors are those that are basically just channels. When they bind to their ligand, they open a channel and they allow ions to flow into the cell or out of the cell. So these receptors, the GABA A, are the main focus of this lecture. The GABA B receptors, on the other hand, are what we call metabotropic receptors. They have GPCR, which is a G-protein coupled receptor. They have an interaction with the ligand with the receptor. They have an activation of a G-protein, as we will see now. This is a GABA-A receptor. We can see that it has five subunits. This is an alpha subunit. This is another alpha subunit. This is a beta subunit. This is a beta subunit. And this is a gamma subunit. Five subunits. And in the middle, we have a channel or a pore that allows chloride ions to flow into the cell. فلما بيجي عندنا الليجند اللي هو الجابا يرتبط بالجابا سايت تبعه زي ما احنا شايفين راح تفتح الشانل الكلورايد راح يدخل من خارج الخلية إلى داخل الخلية ولما كلورايد يدخل لداخل الخلية there is going to be a decrease in the membrane potential يعني it will become more negative واللي هي مسميها hyperpolarization and this hyperpolarization will cause inhibition of the neurons and will therefore accomplish the CNS depression that we want to do here we have the GABA B receptors, which are, you know, not very important for this lecture. But يعني زي ما احنا شايفين, they are uh, GPCRs or G protein coupled receptors. Here we have the uh, ligand binding domain, بيرتبط بالGABA, and usually they exist as dimers, زي ما انتو شايفين, يعني بيكونوا اثنين جنب بعض. And uh, when there is a binding of the ligand to the receptor, we have an activation of an intracellular G protein, اللي هو بيكون consisting of alpha, beta, and gamma. ما علينا مش موضوعنا يعني, I just included it for uh, completion يعني. So, the classes of sedatives, hypnotics, and anxiolytics. Let's get into some classes. Let's get into some actual drugs. The first class we will be taking in this lecture are the benzodiazepines, also called benzos. These are very common drugs. Uh, I'm sure you will hear, you will actually recognize a lot of them because, you know, uh, a lot of us know them from many things like movies or uh, music, for example. The most common class and the most widely used anxiolytics. فهي كثير كثير تستخدم لعلاج الانxiety. And uh, you're gonna see that all of these drugs end in the suffix zolam or zipam. فيعني أي دواء بتلاقي نهايته zolam أو zipam اعرف إنه benzodiazepine. What's the mechanism of action of benzodiazepines? احنا حكينا قبل شوي إنه we want to stimulate GABA transmission because GABA is an inhibitory neurotransmitter. So we want to stimulate GABA transmission to cause inhibition of neurons in order to decrease the CNS activity. So how do these benzodiazepines work? We say benzodiazepines are positive allosteric modulators of the GABA-A receptor. What does positive allosteric modulator? First of all, the word allosteric means that it binds at a different site than the ligand binds to the receptor. مين الليجند بالجابا ريسبتور؟ الليجند هو جابا، which is the neurotransmitter. فلما نحكي إنه benzodiazepines are allosteric, it means that they bind at a different site than جابا. 
تمام؟ they wind at a different site than GABA. فا here we can see the GABA A receptor اللي نحكي عنه which will be the main focus of this lecture. Here we have the two alpha subunits هاي واحدة وهاي ثانية. Here we have two beta subunits and here we have the gamma subunit. الجابه نفسها it binds between the alpha and the beta subunits زي ما انتم شايفين هي هالجابه هون شايفها ترتبط ما بين الالفا والبيتا uh, and we can see this cross section over here نفس الاشي بتتخيلوا if we cut this receptor in half and look at it from above ناخذ الكروس سكشن تبعها هيك راح يكون شكلها في عندنا الفا subunits ثنتين و2 بيتا and 1 جاما ما بين الالفا والبيتا في عندنا الجابا سايت هاي وحده هون وهي انذر جابا سايت بين ذا الفا اند ذا بيتا زي ما احنا شفنا قبل شوي ف ذا بنزو دايازابينز بيكوز ذي ار الستيريك ذي ويل بايند ات ا ديفرنت سايت سبيسيفيكلي ذي ويل بايند بين ذا الفا اند ذا جاما زي ما انتم شايفين هون في عندنا البنزو دايازابين سايت بي زي دي ذس از وير ذا بنزو دايازابين بايندز هون بنقدر نشوفها كمان ما بين الالفا والجاما هي هذا المستطيل this is benzodiazepines and they bind between the alpha and the gamma but this is what allosteric means طب شو يعني positive allosteric modulator the word positive means that when it binds to the receptor it stimulates the transmission of this receptor يعني بتحفز the transmission تمام بينما لو كان negative رح يثبط أو رح يعمل inhibition للtransmission what do benzodiazepines do exactly like شو بيعملوا بالضبط Well, they increase the affinity of GABA to its receptor. They increase the affinity of GABA to its receptor. يعني لما يرتبط البنزو دايازبين بمكانه هون راح يحفز الجابا إنها ترتبط بمكانها هون. Which means that GABA will more frequently bind at the GABA receptor, and this is going to cause more frequent opening of the GABA A receptors. فا if we have an increased affinity of GABA to the receptor, this will lead to more frequent binding of GABA. And when GABA binds more frequently, there is going to be more frequent opening of the channels, which means that no, the channels are going to be open more and more. There is going to be more frequent influx of calcium, because the GABA is going to be open at a rate more than the usual, which means the channels are going to be open for a longer period of time. Which means that more calcium will be able to enter into the neurons, so the neurons are more frequently hyperpolarized, and this will lead to inhibition of the central nervous system. The therapeutic uses of benzodiazepines are uh, they're used in a lot of things. راح نشوف هلا انه they are very widely used in many conditions. First of all, they are used as anxiolytics. فبنستخدمهم بعلاج الانكزايتي او القلق. They are especially used for continued severe anxiety. فيعني دائما بال uh, when we want to treat anxiety disorders, we usually try to uh, put the patient on a cognitive behavioral therapy واللي هو بيكون العلاج النفسي. Uh, this is usually the best option for most patients. ولكن if the patient is not responding to this kind of therapy, if the anxiety is very severe وبتستمر لفترات طويلة, we have to use drugs. لازم نستخدم علاجات أدوية. We have to use pharmacological options. This is when we use benzodiazepines. They're very useful in the treatment of anxiety. However, they are uh, very addictive. They have a very high uh, rate of dependence. So patients are, they experience a lot of dependence for these drugs. بيعتمدوا عليهم كثير, بيدمنوا عليهم كثير. كنا عارفين حتى there's a lot of talk about benzodiazepines in music and uh, a lot of musicians are addicted to these drugs uh, as we will see later. Examples of benzodiazepines include diazepam, زي ما انتو شايفين زبام, the suffix we talked about, clonazepam again, and lorazepam. Here we have, for example, uh, diazepam, uh, also called Valium. By the way, all of these pictures of the drugs, and I have a lot of pictures, I just put them for the visual memory. So uh, what are the drugs or what are the benzodiazepines that we use for anxiety or the treatment of Well, we use diazepam, clonazepam, and lorazepam. These are the three drugs that we use for anxiety. So we have diazepam. Uh, Ativan, also called lorazepam, and uh, clonazepam. 
The second use of benzodiazepines is in muscular disorders. So uh, a lot of diseases, especially those affecting the central nervous system, like multiple sclerosis, or cerebral palsy, these diseases, they cause painful contractions and spasms of the muscles. In order to alleviate the symptoms, uh, to provide analgesia for the patients, we prescribe them benzodiazepines. Uh, benzodiazepines, because they are inhibitory, because they have an inhibitory effect on the central nervous system, they will stop these spasms from happening. They will stop these uh, contractions from happening. And this will provide a lot of relief for the patients. So here we have contractors and spasticity. This is very common in MS or CP. And here we have Walter Jr. from Breaking Bad. Uh, if you guys have watched Breaking Bad, you guys know that Walter Jr. has uh, cerebral palsy. And so, uh, very phenomenal actor, by the way, R.J. Mitt, very good actor. And uh, yeah, uh, he has spastic cerebral palsy, which is a kind of cerebral palsy that causes painful contractions. And so, benzodiazepines would be a very good option for such patients. Uh, the third use of benzodiazepines is in pre-anesthesia and conscious sedation. So you might be wondering, what is pre-anesthesia? Uh, pre-anesthesia means before anesthesia. يعني قبل ما نحط البيشنت بتخدير عام, we give them the benzodiazepines. طب ليش ممكن تسألني؟ بيقول لك we use them as pre-anesthetic sedatives. مهدئات ما قبل التخدير. Why do we use them? Because they make anesthesia safer and more agreeable to the patient. And before we put patients into anesthesia, they have a lot of anxiety, they're very scared of the operation. So we don't want them to go into anesthesia while they are scared. So usually beforehand, we will give them the benzodiazepines to calm them down, to sedate them, تمام? and to make sure that they are more uh, agreeable to the anesthesia and they are less anxious about it. This will make anesthesia safer and much better for the patient. Uh, conscious sedation, on the other hand, is a completely different thing. Has a conscious sedation is an alternative to anesthesia. فهي بديل للتخدير العام. في بعض العمليات زي for example ال endoscopies وال bronchoscopies اللي هي تنظير المعدة وتنظير الرئة. These are anxiety provoking procedures. يعني بسبب قلق وبسبب توتر للpatient. Before we go into these procedures, we give the patients benzodiazepines in order to put them into a state of calm, into a state of sedation. أساساً يكون مرتاح وهادي ولكن they are still conscious. تمام؟ يعني ما بيكون نايم. They are not uh, anesthetized. لا, they are still conscious. That's why it's called conscious sedation. ولكن they are very calm. They are very relaxed. And this will make the whole procedure much easier for the patient. Now, one thing about the conscious sedation, you know, there is amnesia when the drugs wear off. يعني the patient, لما يطلع من العملية هاي, زي for example, the endoscopy or the bronchoscopy, ومنكون عاطين وبنزوديازبي من قبل, بس يخلص تأثير الدواء, the patient will forget that they had the procedure. رح ينسى كل إشي. Amnesia اللي هو the, the loss of memory. So they will forget that they had a procedure completely. So yeah, benzodiazepines can actually cause amnesia for the event, which is uh, the operation. Uh, usually, for uh, pre-anesthesia and conscious sedation, we usually like to use short-acting benzodiazepines. اللي بيكون مفعوله قصير ما بيكون مفعوله لمدة طويلة. لا بدنا بس يكون مفعوله لمدة محددة اللي هي مدة العملية. ف examples of short-acting benzodiazepines are midazolam. We can see it over here, which is the drug of choice for this kind of thing for uh, anesthesia and conscious sedation. The fourth use of benzodiazepines is in epilepsy and in seizures. As a matter of fact, they are the drug of choice for epilepsy and seizures. They are very widely used nowadays. Specifically, we use them for grand mal seizures, tonic clonic seizures. This is another name for them. By the way, grand mal seizures are the typical example of a seizure. اللي هي what most of us think of a seizure. لما نحكي عن نوبة الصرع, أول إشي بيخطر عبالنا اللي هو الpatient اللي بيكون عنده انقباضات عضلية مفاجئة, very very sudden contractions. تمام? This is what a grand mal seizure is. بنسميها tonic clonic لأنه tonic means sudden muscle stiffness and the clonic means the contractions. فهي باختصار the typical seizure that you think of when you think of seizures. 
And status epilepticus is the kind of seizure that lasts more than five minutes. So this is a medical emergency and we need to treat it very immediately. So we use benzodiazepines to treat this kind of seizure. Usually, the drugs of choice for uh, seizures are lorazepam or diazepam. Diazepam is called Valium, as we lorazepam is Ativan. All right, so the fifth use of benzodiazepines is in the treatment of sleep disorders, uh, like insomnia, for example, اللي هو الأرق. The features of insomnia, الأعراض اللي بنشوفها على مريض الأرق, is that they have an increased latency of sleep. Now, what does that mean? An increased latency of sleep means that the patient needs more time to fall asleep than the average human being. So, for example, instead of falling asleep in a, in a few minutes or maybe like uh, 30 minutes, they fall asleep in a few hours. So, if they go to bed at 9 p.m., they're going to fall asleep at 12 a.m. or 1 a.m. So, they're going to spend a lot of time in bed trying to fall asleep, but they can't. So, this is called increased latency. The second feature, which is very common, is frequent awakening. This means that the patient may be able to fall asleep quickly, ولكن they're going to keep waking up in the middle of the night again and again. They're gonna, their sleep is going to be interrupted, and they're not going to be able to fall back asleep every time they wake up. So this is a very big problem. And of course, there's a general reduction in the total sleeping time. So... Uh, the mechanism of action of benzodiazepines in treating such disorders is that they increase the stage 2 of non-REM sleep. So what is non-REM sleep and uh, what is REM sleep? So there are two types of sleep that we cycle through every night. So every, every night that we sleep, we cycle through two types of sleep, REM sleep and non-REM sleep. REM sleep, R-E-M stands for rapid eye movement, is a phase of our sleep cycles that consists of rapid eye movements where our eyes move very rapidly. تمام? This is the phase where we dream, where we have dreams. Uh, Non-REM sleep, on the other hand, we don't have movement of the eyes. And this is where we don't have dreams. Okay. Now, uh, non-REM sleep has three stages, stage one, stage two, and stage three. And the mechanism of action of benzodiazepines to allow for hypnosis and to allow for maintenance of good sleep is that they increase the duration of stage two of the non-REM sleep so that the patient will have a longer duration of sleep in general. Now, even though benzodiazepines are a good option for treatment of insomnia, they have a few problems. The biggest problem, this is probably the most important problem, is that they cause rebound insomnia. Rebound اللي هي المرتجعة, الأرق المرتجع, which means in when the patient stops taking the drugs, خلص, they continue and finish their prescription, they will get their insomnia back even worse than before. And uh, this is a symptom of dependence اللي هو الاعتماد إنه البيشنت صار يعتمد على هاي الأدوية علشان ينام فلما يبطل يأخذها ببطل يعرف ينام And this is called rebound insomnia Another thing which is a common problem for elderly patients And this is a very good point of caution We have to be very cautious when prescribing benzodiazepines to elderly patients in the, Is that the benzodiazepines are sedative drugs So if the patient is taking them for hypnosis in order to sleep If they have insomnia uh, the benzodiazepines also have a sedative effect. So, for example, if they wake up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom, they will be under sedation from the benzodiazepines, so their movements are not going to be coordinated. And they are going to be shaky. But this is what this will increase their chances of falling down and causing fractures and broken bones. And so we have to be very careful when prescribing these drugs to elderly patients. Now, examples of some uh, hypnotic uh, benzodiazepines that we use for the treatment of insomnia include fluorazepam, which is a long-acting benzodiazepine. Uh, here we can see it in the name of Dalmain. trade names I just put these uh, pictures of the drugs for visual memory. Temazepam is an intermediate acting drug and this is taken one to two hours before bed. Here we can see it. This is a generic drug. 
and triazolam is another one but it's short acting and this one has the highest risk of rebound insomnia because it's very short acting so something you have to know in بالنسبة لأدوية البنزودياسبينز we have three types long acting intermediate acting and short acting رح نأخذ عنهم بعد شوي ولكن just before we go I want you to know إنه the shorter the duration of action of the benzodiazepine the higher the chance of a rebound insomnia يعني الفلورازيبام which is long acting has the lowest chance of rebound insomnia تمازيبام has the second lowest chance and triazolam has the highest risk of rebound insomnia تمام؟ فعشان هيك we have to understand انه كلما قل duration of action تبع البنزودياسبين كلما زادت الخطأ الرسك تبع الريباوند insomnia so what is rebound insomnia? We just said and we did, we discussed rebound insomnia and uh, it is a withdrawal symptom. Now withdrawal symptom is a kind of symptom that results from cessation of the drug. Upon cessation of the drug. Here insomnia comes back sometimes even worse than before زي ما شفنا قبل شوي وحكينا انه short acting benzodiazepines have the highest risk of rebound insomnia وانه كل ما قل duration of action كل ما زادت الرسك of rebound insomnia Here we have a very good chart explaining what we just talked about uh, This on the x-axis shows the increase in total wake time from the baseline in percentage after stopping the drug يعني باختصار هاي البرسنتجز اللي بتكون تحت على الاكس اكسس هي عبارة عن الزيادة بالوقت اللي uh, طبعا هي بالبرسنتج it's in, uh, it's in percentages it's the increase in the total wake time يعني الزيادة بالوقت الصاحي اللي بيقعد فيه البيشنت وهو نايم يعني for example احنا لما نروح ننام خلينا نقول مثلا من الساعة 11 للساعة 6 this is seven hours of sleep. So obviously we're not going to sleep all of these seven hours. رح يكون في عنا شوية waking intervals. For example, الأول ما ندخل على التخت لأنه ما رح نعرف ننام على طول. ف let's say for example that an average wake time is only about five percent. تمام؟ here we see the increase in the total wake time from the baseline after stopping the drug يعني بعد ما يخلص المريض من هذا الدواء هل بيزيد عنده ال percentage of the wake time ولا هل بيقل عنده ال percentage of the wake time طبعا كلما زاد ال percentage of the wake time كلما زادت كمية الوقت اللي بقعد فيها المريض صاحي ومش عارف ينام بينما كلما قلت ال total wake time كلما قل هذا الوقت وكلما زادت كمية الوقت اللي بيقعدها ال patient وهو نايم تمام؟ فهير we can see the different drugs Fluorazepam which is a long acting Diazepam which is another long acting Temazepam which is intermediate acting Alprazolam which is intermediate acting And finally we have Triazolam which is a short acting benzodiazepine هسا بقول لك هون the less potent and more slowly eliminated drugs اللي هما بيكون duration of action تبعهم طويلة for example Fluorazepam continue to improve sleep even after discontinuation يعني بعد ما يوقف المريض الفلورازيبام prescription تبعته you can see انه there is actually a decrease in the total wake time which means انه the patient is able to enjoy more hours of sleep after they finish taking the drug يعني this drug is phenomenal it's working very good we can see here diazepam is also good because there is a very 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 small increase in the total wake time Temazepam a little bit more because it's uh, intermediate acting Alprazolam is also a little bit more Well I can try Azolam almost has a 50% increase in the total wake time Which means you know, the patient is spending 50% more time awake in bed than they used to do before they took the drug so, yani their insomnia is actually getting worse after they stop taking triazolam. For the drugs that are more potent and rapidly eliminated, for example, el triazolam have more frequent and severe withdrawal problems. So, this is again something that you have to consider when prescribing these drugs to patients. So, what are the side effects of benzodiazepines? Uh, the first side effects are what we call the paradoxical effects. So, paradoxical means something that can be explained, something that is إشي عجيب, تمام؟ أنا كتبت هون opposite لأنه لما نحكي paradoxical effect إشي عجيب لأنه it is the exact opposite of what you expect أنت لما تعطي benzodiazepine لـ patient you are expecting them to be calm or sedated and relaxed لأنه هاي الأدوية they are supposed to be sedatives 
ولكن sometimes in a small percentage of patients when you give them benzodiazepines they become agitated they become excited they become scared يعني بيعملوا كل شيء عكس اللي انت عطيته الدواء عشانه انت you're supposed to give the drug to cause sedation لا هذول البيشنتس very small percentage of them they become overly agitated زي مثلا هذا الختيار اللي هون so this is an example of a side effect The second, and this is very, very important, is tolerance and dependence. Something I've already said, and you know, the benzodiazepines have a high potential for addiction. Tolerance, اللي هو الاعتياد, dependence, اللي هو الاعتماد. الاعتياد أو التولرنس اللي هو البيشنت بتعود على الجرعات اللي بياخذها. وكل ما تعود على الجرعات بيضطر إنه ياخذ جرعات أكبر علشان يحس بنفس الإفكت. والdependence اللي هو الاعتماد means that the patient cannot live without the drug. وفي نوعين من الديبندنس طبعا اللي هو الفيزيولوجيكال والسايكولوجيكال بوث اوف ذيم ار امبورتنت هير انه البيشنت وين ذي ستوب ذا دراج ذي ويل هاف سيمتومز اوف فيزيولوجيكال ديبندنس فراح تلاقيه مثلا مش عارف ينام بيكوز اوف ستوبينج ذا دراج اند اولسو سايكولوجيكال ديبندنس از ويل فذ ذيس از اول فيري باد هسا ذا ويذدرول سيمتومز ريزولتينج فروم بنزودايازيبين سيسيشن اند بيكوز اتس ا فيري ديبندنت دراج انكلود ريباوند انسومنيا سمثينج ويف اوريدي سيد كونفيوجن انزايتي agitation, restlessness, tension, convulsions, and even seizures. لاحظوا إنه كل ال withdrawal symptoms are the exact indications of the benzodiazepines. إحنا هاي الأشياء إحنا we give benzodiazepines to treat these things. We give benzodiazepines to treat insomnia, to treat anxiety, to treat agitation, to treat convulsions and seizures. So when we give the patients these drugs and they stop taking them, they start experiencing these problems that we are treating for in the first place. تمام؟ and this makes sense because the brain is used to being inhibited by the benzodiazepines. so when you remove them from the patient, when the patient stops taking them, the patient, the brain is going to be overly fired and there's going to be an overactivity of the brain that's going to cause all of these symptoms of anxiety and other things. now again, just like we said with rebound insomnia, the chance of tolerance and dependence and withdrawal symptoms increases for short acting drugs more than long acting drugs يعني الادويه اللي بيكون مفعولها قصير the short acting drugs they have a higher chance of tolerance and a higher chance of dependence than the long acting drug something you have to keep into consideration so the third side effect is drowsiness or sedation Now, yes, isn't this a therapeutic use? إحنا مش بنستعمل البنزودياسبينز to cause drowsiness and sedation. Why is it listed as a side effect? It, it's technically not a side effect. لأنه yes, we are giving these drugs to patients for this exact reason. ولكن uh, we have to be very careful and we have to warn patients. لازم نحذرهم إنه هاي الأدوية رح تعمل لك ارتخاء ورح تعمل لك نعاس. And this can be very dangerous, for example, when driving. Or when operating heavy machinery, for example, the hadadin or the najarin, اللي بيستخدموا مثلا مناشير وأشياء زي هيك, they have to be very careful when operating these machinery when they are on these benzodiazepines. ممكن for example, we don't allow them to take these drugs when they are working. لأنه هاي الأشياء راح تأثر عليهم بشدة. As a matter of fact, I once read that drowsy driving is actually more dangerous than drunk driving. يعني ال القيادة على نعاس أسوأ وأخطر من القيادة على سكر. But this is very important and we have to warn patients about this. Uh, of course, another thing with drowsiness and sedation is that there is a level of cognitive impairment that comes with it. يعني the patient ما راح يكون مصحصح So we have to be very careful when uh, prescribing these medications to students who have exams, for example, or businessmen who have work. لأنه هذا الإشي راح يأثر على their performance. They're not going to be able to take their exams well. They're not going to be able to study. So again, we have to balance all these things. The fourth side effect is that there's a dangerous combination of these benzodiazepines with other brain function inhibitors. So this includes alcohol, barbiturates, anesthetics. When we combine these brain function inhibitors with benzodiazepines, it can cause very dangerous side effects that are almost like overdose. ف... We have to warn patients about this, especially those who, يعني, uh, in Western society, for example, uh, drinking alcohol socially is very common. So if a patient is being treated for anxiety uh, by benzodiazepines, for example, they're not going to think twice about going out with friends and drinking alcohol. So we have to warn them, and maybe, hey, you can't drink alcohol with, while, while you're on benzodiazepines. Uh, of course, this can lead to extremely toxic effects when the patient combines benzodiazepines with high brain function inhibitors. This can lead to extremely toxic effects that can eventually lead to death. Now, the fifth side effect 
uh, of benzodiazepines is enterograde amnesia so uh, or finding dory disease as we will see in a bit so the word enterograde means moving forward and amnesia means loss of memory so enterograde amnesia means loss of memory moving forward شو معنى هذا الحكي معناته انه all the memories that the patient already has before taking benzodiazepines will be unaffected يعني الpatient ما رح ينسى شو اسمه ما رح ينسى وين بيشتغل ما رح ينسى اسم امه ما رح ينسى انه بسكن بالعنوان الفلاني they will not forget the memories they already have ولكن they will not be able to form new memories they will not be able to retain new information ما رح يعرف يتذكر اشياء جديدة يعني لو قلت له مثلا ممكن بالله تروح تجيب لي كاسة مي من المطبخ رح يوصل على المطبخ ورح ينسى على طول انت شو شو سألته وشو طلبت منه ف they will not be able to retain new information تمام inability to retain new information ف this is the reason it's called finding dory disease is because uh, dory which is from this movie finding dory uh, she has anterograde amnesia so whenever she swims somewhere she forgets where she's swimming and so she made this catchphrase for herself which is just keep swimming so that she doesn't keep stopping and asking herself hey where was i swimming فخلص كل ما بتلاقي حالها بتنسى she just tells herself just keep swimming Uh, who would that affect? That would affect people like students, for example, who are coming up on exams. They have to do a lot of reviewing on material. But this will affect them a lot if they are not able to retain new information. So this is another consideration for us for uh, prescribing benzodiazepines. Now, let's talk about the pharmacokinetics of benzodiazepines. Uh, first of all, they are very lipophilic medications or lipid soluble. And when something is lipophilic, it can very easily cross the membranes in our body. Now, our membranes are all lipids. They are lipid bilayers. But when they cross membranes easily, this can give us a couple of things. First of all, they have very good oral absorption. Yani benzodiazepines can be absorbed orally almost 100%. So this is very good. They can easily cross the blood-brain barrier, which makes sense. Then we want these drugs to act on the central nervous system. They have to. And they can also cross the blood-placenta barrier. And this is very important because it's a pregnancy contradiction. Uh, contraindication, sorry. It's a pregnancy contraindication. We cannot prescribe benzodiazepines for pregnant ladies because this will affect the baby directly. It will cross the placenta and go into the fetal circulation. And I even read in our book, Lua Lippincott, you know, it can actually be transmitted through breastfeeding. So we have to be careful about that when prescribing benzodiazepines to breastfeeding mothers. The second thing about benzodiazepines is that they became an orally, something we've already said. They can be given IV and they can be given IM. Uh, thirdly, they are highly protein bound to albumin in the plasma. The percentage is something between 80 to 90% bound to plasma. So uh, yeah, this is uh, something we have to know. And number four, they are metabolized by microsomal enzymes of the liver. Yeah, obviously, uh, every drug is. Some produce active metabolites. So some of these benzodiazepines, we will see later, when they are metabolized by the liver, they produce active metabolites that continue to have a sedative or anxiolytic or hypnotic effect. But this will lead to a longer duration of action. Well, I can call the benzodiazepines. Eventually, they will be uh, uh, metabolized by conjugation and excretion in the kidneys. They will be conjugated in the liver and excreted in the kidneys. Now, Uh, let's classify benzodiazepines depending on their duration of action. First of all, we have the long-acting benzodiazepines. Uh, long-acting benzodiazepines, like we said, they produce active metabolites, which means that they continue to have an effect even after they are metabolized by the liver. So this will extend their half-life. Examples of benzodiazepines include the diazepam, which is the prototype, the class, very important, also called Valium. Fluorazepam, another important drug, clonazepam, and chlordiazepoxide. Could I add we mean long acting benzodiazepines? Diazepam, we can see it over here. Fluorazepam, uh, this one right over here. And clonazepam, which is this one right over here. And chlordiazepoxide, which I didn't include. Active metabolites, they mahakena, are produced by the metabolism of long acting benzos. Uh, these active metabolites can include things like desmethyldiazepam also called nordazepam, and another active metabolite is oxazepam. Now, interestingly enough, these active metabolites, for example, nordazepam with oxazepam, these active metabolites are 
drugs on their own يعني بتقدر they can actually be bought in pharmacies هم either actual drugs فإنه يعني these long acting benzodiazepines زي الدiazepam they will be metabolized and they will form a new benzodiazepine drug which will continue to circulate in the patient and continue to have an effect ف yeah this is something interesting the long acting benzos can be given orally IV or IM something we've already discussed طبعا by the way uh, the importance of this in uh, we can use the benzodiazepines for different things so for example orally we can give oral benzodiazepines for anxiety or hypnosis يعني بيقدر البيشنت ياخذهم orally before they sleep for example or on a regular basis for their anxiety ولكن IV or IM هاي الشغلات بتكون مهمة مثلا when we're talking about seizures when a patient has a seizure أو نوبة صرع ما رح نقدر نقول له بالله بلعلي هاي الحبة that's gonna be very difficult because of their contractions فعلى طول بنعطيهم إياها IV أو IM but that's the useful thing about it uh, long acting benzodiazepines have excellent oral bioavailability which means you know, they are almost 100% available from their absorption in the gut until the point they are in the systemic circulation because their uh, first pass metabolism in the liver produces active metabolites فعشان هيك they are almost 100% and they accumulate in organs due to lipophilicity because they are very lipophilic they tend to accumulate in organs after they are distributed by the bloodstream and this will further increase their duration of action ليش لانه after the drug is eliminated from the body there are still stores in different parts of the body that have a lot of fat which will continue to release benzodiazepines after the drug has been removed from the bloodstream but this will extend the duration of action now زي ما حكينا uh, even though there is a formation of active metabolites eventually all the benzodiazepines will undergo a conjugation or اللي هي glucuronidation in the liver and then they will be excreted in the kidneys in the urine uh, they have a long half life زي ما حكينا which can reach up to 100 hours with active metabolites يعني ال half life احنا بنحسبها مع ال active metabolites لانه they are still considered a drug because they are still having an effect on the patient uh, Long-acting benzos are used in many different things. We can use them as anxiolytics, we can use them as anticonvulsants, seizures. Uh, as a matter of fact, they are the drug of choice in status epilepticus, the seizure that lasts more than five minutes. The, the, the long-acting benzos are the drug of choice. Uh, we can use them as sedative hypnotics in settings of insomnia or sedation. And we can even use them as muscle relaxants in conditions like cerebral palsy. So they are very useful. They have a few side effects, of course, like any other benzodiazepines. Uh, they produce anterograde amnesia, something that uh, we already discussed. And, of course, they have a rate of tolerance and dependence. So addiction, withdrawal symptoms, something we've already went over. And the tolerance and dependence increases the shorter the duration of action. So even though these long-acting benzodiazepines, they do have tolerance and dependence, it's comparatively less than other drugs, as we will see now. Uh, the second class are the intermediate acting benzos اللي هما بيكونوا uh, their half life is between 9 to 20 hours يعني هما بالنص ما بين الشورت واللونج examples include lorazepam temazepam alprazolam and oxazepam so lorazepam اللي هو حكينا عنه already الاتيفان التمازيبام which is a intermediate acting اسمه هون ريستوريل الالبرازولام which is something i'm sure you have all heard of اللي هو الزانكس very common drug and oxazepam is also another, which we already discussed, by the way, as an active metabolite, is also a drug on its own. Hasa, I included the oxazepam horn with intermediate acting benzos, but you will also see in I'll put it with the short acting benzos. Because the half life of oxazepam, as I have seen, is between 6 to 20 hours. So this puts it in the range of short and intermediate acting benzos. But it is as it is as a short to intermediate. The half-life is between 9 to 20 hours. The uses of intermediate acting benzos is for anxiety, epilepsy, nausea, and vomiting. It's unusual. This is the first time we uh, include nausea and vomiting as an indication for benzodiazepines. No, We just talked about anxiety and uh, insomnia. What does nausea and vomiting have to do with this? After some research, I found that uh, they are given for nausea and vomiting when it is caused by anxiety. Then one of the symptoms of anxiety is nausea and vomiting, especially when it's a little bit severe. So we can give it benzodiazepines to treat such a thing. Muscle spasms, we've already said that, and insomnia. Uh, they have high tolerance, higher than a long-acting benzos, and they also have a higher dependence than the long-acting benzos. Because we already <laughs> we said this a million times. 
uh, no more than four weeks. So because of this, we cannot give them more than four weeks. Then no, the, there's a high chance of addiction. Finally, we move to the short-acting benzos, and these are the ones that have a half-life of two to six hours. تمام. You will see, and I included oxazepam here again. لأنه زي ما حكيت لكم, the half-life is between six to twenty hours. So this is why it's it's a short to intermediate acting. فهي بالنص ما بين الثنتين. So I included it in both. Uh, examples of short-acting benzos include midazolam, something we've already discussed in the anesthesia, triazolam, برضو حكينا عنه, and oxazepam. تمام. The half-life is between two to six hours, and there is an increased tolerance and an increased dependence, even more than the intermediate acting and the long acting. These short-acting benzos have the highest chance of tolerance and dependence. So we have to be very careful. The uses, like we said, they are used as pre-anesthetic sedatives. We've already discussed the use of midazolam in that uh, in that subject. Uh, conscious sedation, again, in endoscopies or bronchoscopies, which makes sense. Like, you know, these are uh, surgical procedures that don't take a lot of time. Yani, at most, they will take a few hours. So we don't want to give a long-acting benzodiazepine. We'll give them a short-acting benzodiazepine, which will only do it for a few hours. They're also used as anti-convulsants, well, like only in the absence of long-acting benzos. Like, we saw that in the treatment of status epilepticus, the drug of choice was long-acting benzos. So when there is a complete absence of long-acting benzos, what how we will move to the short-acting benzos. So we only use them in the absence of long-acting benzos. Okay? They're also used in the short-term treat, uh, short treatment of insomnia. But due to a high risk of rebound insomnia, we don't want to uh, continue prescribing the drug. We only give them as a short-term treatment. If they take it for a long term, they are definitely going to become addicted to it. It's a very powerful drug, and the short-acting nature of it makes it even more addicting. We only use them for very short-term treatment of anxiety, uh, for insomnia, sorry. So, in summary, going over the drugs that we just had, uh, for anxiety, we prefer to use intermediate to long-acting drugs. Uh, one example is Alprazolam or Xanax. This is a very common anxiolytic drug, and uh, yeah, it's an intermediate-acting uh, benzodiazepine. Now, for status epilepticus, uh, which is the seizure disorder that lasts more than five minutes, we obviously prefer to give the patient an IV medication because they can't swallow. We can't ask a patient during a seizure to take any oral medications due to the very heavy contractions and uh, most of the time they're going to be unconscious. For that reason, we prefer certain medications that are IV. Has, uh, usually, we prefer the long-acting benzodiazepines, zay like diazepam, for example, which is Valium. But we can also use an intermediate-acting uh, benzodiazepine, such as lorazepam, also called Ativan. Uh, then, of course, anesthesia induction, we prefer to use a short-acting benzodiazepines, such as midazolam. And for insomnia, this is something the doctor said, and no, we like to start with some short-acting benzodiazepines, and then we can move to intermediate-acting benzodiazepines. تمام. So for example here we have temazepam and oxazepam ممكن مثلا نبلش البيشنت على oxazepam and then we move to something like temazepam ولكن of course we have to make sure that the patient doesn't take the oxazepam for a long period of time because of the addiction potential Now let's talk about benzodiazepine overdose Given that these drugs are highly addictive, they have a high risk of tolerance and dependence uh, benzodiazepine overdose uh, isn't very unlikely. Uh, it's something that very commonly happens around the world and we have to be familiar with it. So what are the signs and symptoms of a benzodiazepine overdose? Well, there is an increased risk of benzodiazepine overdose when it's combined with other CNS depressants. Something I've already discussed in the side effects when we said that combining benzodiazepines with other brain function inhibitors like alcohols, opioids, anesthetics, barbiturates, and even tricyclic antidepressants will actually make it very dangerous and will lead to extremely toxic effects that will lead to death. So this is again, uh, just repeating the point. By the way, I put tricyclic antidepressants in red because it was mentioned in our lecture, well, I can, I'm not sure how it's a CNS depressant. I'm gonna ask the doctor and inshallah, I will update you guys in the description box. Uh, so, let's talk about the toxidrome of benzodiazepine overdose. Uh, toxidrome means the collection of symptoms associated with an overdose. So, what is the toxidrome of benzodiazepine overdose? Well, we have drowsiness, 
loss of consciousness, patients usually, they completely faint, uh, slurred speech, so they won't be able to give you a clear enunciation of the words, ataxia, which is a loss of motor coordination. The patients are not going to be able to perform tasks like walking or picking up objects. يعني حركتهم بشكل عام راح تكون زي السكران. تمام؟ There's a loss of coordination. CVS depression, cardiovascular system depression. So there's going to be hypotension. Uh, and of course, respiratory system depression. So there will be a very low respiratory rate. So for example, instead of being 15 breaths per minute, we'll have only 4 to 5. Uh, this is uh, these are the symptoms of a benzodiazepine overdose. Okay, so the symptoms are very similar to opioid overdose. The symptoms of benzodiazepine overdose that we just saw look very similar to what we see in opioid overdose. So how do we tell the difference whether a patient has a benzodiazepine overdose or an opioid overdose? How can we very quickly tell the difference? I'm going to let Al Pacino from Scarface tell you exactly how we can tell the difference. So, yes, just like he said, the eyes, Chico, they never lie. Here we want to look at the patient's eyes because they are the secret to telling us whether the patient has a benzodiazepine overdose or a uh, opioid overdose. The answer is in the pupils. The important thing to know here is that opioids cause meiosis, something we have already seen, and they cause what we call a pinpoint pupils. This is a characteristic feature of opioid overdose, while I can benzodiazepines do not cause meiosis. So this is the easiest way to tell them apart. And when the patient has constricted pupils, I will pinpoint the pupils, like this here for example, we immediately think of opioids like heroin, morphine, oxycodone, fentanyl. Well, I can, if the patient has red eyes, then we can think of benzodiazepines like Xanax, for example, because that is indicative of a uh, benzodiazepine overdose. Well, I can pinpoint pupils, I will constricted, I will meiosis, that is immediately going to opioids. So meiosis equals opioid overdose, no meiosis equals benzodiazepine overdose. So how do we treat a benzodiazepine overdose? Say a patient comes into the hospital and we suspect a benzodiazepine overdose, what is the treatment protocol? The most important or the most urgent thing that we have to do is to maintain their respiration because one of the most important symptoms of a benzodiazepine overdose is a depression in the respiratory system. So the patient will be very heavily uh, restricted in their breathing. They will only breathe like five breaths per minute. So we have to maintain their respiration. How do we do that? By intubating the patient and putting them on mechanical ventilation. Intubation, we already know what it is, inserting a tube into their trachea, and we put them on a machine called the mechanical ventilator to breathe for them, essentially, to make sure that they don't go into hypoxia. So. Is there an antidote for benzodiazepine overdose? Yes, there is. The antidote is called flumazenil, and flumazenil is a benzodiazepine antagonist. And what that means is that, I want to bring you back to the uh, structure of the GABA receptor. We said that benzodiazepines bind between the alpha and the gamma subunits of the uh, GABA receptor. So when we say that flumazenil is a benzodiazepine antagonist, this means that it's going to bind at the same site as benzodiazepine without exerting any effect. Yani it will simply block that binding site to prevent benzodiazepine from binding. So it will bind at the same site as benzodiazepines, which is between the alpha and the gamma subunit, and it will therefore act as an antidote. Has said, flumazenil is a very controversial drug because of multiple reasons, which we're going to see now. Our issue, it might not be effective in long-term benzo users. يعني لو كان الpatients عنده benzodiazepine overdose وصار له زمان بيأخذ benzodiazepines, they have been a long-term user of benzos. The flumazenil might not be very effective for these patients. ثاني إشي, they could cause epilepsy. لأنه ها إحنا هاي الأدوية لما نعطيها خصوصا بالذات لما الpatient overdoses on benzodiazepines that they are using to manage seizures then no, benzodiazepines are used in the management of epilepsy so if they overdose on benzodiazepines and we give them flumazenil as an antidote this might actually cause them seizures or epilepsy so for that reason we have to be very carefully monitoring the patient when we give them flumazenil to make sure that they don't get seizures and if they do we treat them immediately uh, flumazenil may also cause cardiac arrhythmias and 
Flumazenil has a very short duration of action compared to benzodiazepines. يعني أنا I I once read إنه it's somewhere between one to two hours only. يعني بعد ساعة ساعتين خلاص بيكون خلص مفعوله. And this means إنه we have to continue giving the patient flumazenil again and again, which means إنه frequent administration is necessary for the patient. لأنه راح يخلص مفعوله, so we have to keep giving it again and again because of its very short duration of action. And this is where something called recidivism might happen when we don't administer flumazenil frequently لما يجي البيشن عنده benzodiazepine overdose and we only give them flumazenil once because of the very short duration of action بس يخلص مفعول الفلومازنل the benzodiazepine is still in the patient's system فأول ما يخلص مفعول الفلومازنل the benzodiazepine is going to continue to cause an overdose ورح يرجع يعمل للpatient sedation هاي احنا منسميها re-sedation to prevent re-sedation we have to do frequent administration of flumazenil إن ضلنا نعطي البيشن هذا الانتidote عبان ما يطلع البنزودياسبين من جسمه so, moving on to the second class of sedative hypnotics and anxiolytics. هيك احنا خلصنا من benzodiazepines, probably the most important class in this lecture. Now we move to a second class, which is actually an older generation of drugs. This, uh, these are called barbiturates. Barbiturates are uh, first generation older drugs. احنا كنا نستخدمهم قبل benzodiazepines, before we discovered the benzodiazepines. They were the... The uh, protocol for the management of anxiety and insomnia and uh, epilepsy hatta. But they are older drugs essentially. And we discontinued the use of barbiturates because of many reasons which we will see right now. So barbiturates have been quickly replaced by benzodiazepines due to a side effect profile that is very heavy as you can see over here. في عنا liver toxicity, this is very common in barbiturate users. There is also induction of the liver enzymes. يعني there is going to be an activation of these liver enzymes which means you know, this will present with a lot of drug-drug interactions. And this is especially important. لأنه if you think about it, most of the users of barbiturates are old in age. لأنه مشاكل الانزايتي والانسومنية it, it usually presents in the older age patients فلما يأخذوا الباربيتشورتس هاي they are probably also taking medications for other medical conditions like hypertension for example or any other thing فthis will lead to drug drug interactions with the drugs that they are already taking because of this induction of liver enzymes so we have to do a lot of dose correction لهاي الأدوية عشان uh, to make sure انه they are not receiving more or less than they need Barbiturates have a very high level of dependence, very high level of tolerance. أكثر بكثير من البنزوس. تمام؟ يعني this is why we discontinued them because they are extremely addicted, uh, addictive. Sorry, with severe withdrawal symptoms. يعني much much worse than what we see in benzodiazepine withdrawal. Here it's much worse. It's very severe, and this is why we discontinued them. And also they are more lethal. يعني in general they are more deadly. وراح نشوف هسا كمان شوي the comparison between the barbiturates and benzodiazepines just to show you how dangerous these barbiturates are. They are so dangerous as a matter of fact that I read recently you know, they are using barbiturates in the United States as the execution method uh, by lethal injection. اللي هو الإعدام عندهم بالبعض ولايات المتحدة some of the states, not all of them. Some of the states use barbiturates uh, for example pentobarbital or thiopental uh, to perform lethal injections اللي هي الإعدامات بالحقن they are so so lethal and so dangerous and let's talk about them now so the mechanism of action of barbiturates is also on the GABA-A receptor تمام? the main focus of this lecture uh, ولكن they don't bind at the same site and they don't have the same action as the benzodiazepines the benzodiazepines they bind between the alpha and the gamma this is a cross section of the GABA-A receptor by the way هاي الالفا هاي الالفا subunit وهاي الجامعه subunit between them we have the benzodiazepine site طبعا هون في عنا كمان الالفا والبيتا في عنا البنزو سوري الجابا سايت this is a GABA site this is another GABA site the uh, barbiturates they bind close to the chloride channel شايفين الكلوريد شانل اللي بالنص in the middle or in the center of the uh, GABA receptor here close to it we have the binding of mean of the barbiturates شايفين this is the barbiturates it binds very close to the chloride channel and what it does is that when it binds to this site it will increase the opening time of the uh, GABA receptor يعني when the GABA 
this gaba right over here هاي المستطيل هذا اللي هون يرتبط بالجابا ريسبتر شو راح يصير راح تفتح الريسبتر the channel will open and chloride will enter into the cell طبعا this opening of the channel is only for a small time period لما يجي يرتبط عنا شو اسمه الباربيتشورت it is going to increase this opening time فعشان انه لما يجي يرتبط الجابا هاي الشانل يظلها مفتوحة لفترة طويلة أطول بكثير من العادة which means انه it remains open for longer periods of time Chlor uh, chloride ions enter into the cell more frequently hyperpolarization occurs more frequently and general depression and the inhibition of the central nervous system occurs so here we can see a general outline barbiturates increase the binding time of GABA to its receptor يعني it will allow GABA to stay bound to the receptor for longer periods of time which means in the calcium pores or channels remain open for longer periods of time so more calcium enters into the neurons so neurons in the central nervous system are hyperpolarized more than normal which leads to sedation, anxiolysis, hypnosis, etc. باختصار, just to summarize, the benzodiazepines, they increased the frequency of binding between GABA and the receptor. يعني GABA a بيرتبط بالreceptor تبعه at a higher rate, at a higher rate, which means إنه the channels are going to open more frequently. بينما بالbarbiturates, they cause the GABA to remain bound to its receptor for longer periods of time. يعني بدل ما يرتبط ويفك بسرعة, لا, بيرتبط وبيظل مرتبط لفترة طويلة عشان يسمح للشانل إنها ظلها مفتوحة لفترة طويلة to allow more and more chloride to enter into the neurons more than normal. تمام? And this is how the hyperpolarization happens. Now, this is exactly why we no longer use barbiturates. Here we have a dose response curve. On the x-axis we have the dose of the drugs that we're going to discuss. And on the y-axis we have the response. اللي هو شو بصير بالpatient. عنا this graph over here is the benzodiazepines. And this graph over here is the barbiturates. أول إشي we want to see the dose dependent relationship. كلما زاد the dose of these drugs, كلما زاد the effect زي ما حكينا ببداية المحاضرة. So if we increase the dose زي ما أنتوا شايفين, we move up uh, the uh, response. فمنبلش for example at anxiolysis, then we move to sedation, then to sleep, then to unconsciousness, then anesthesia, then coma, then depression of the respiration and cardiovascular regulation, and then death. تمام؟ هاي كلما زاد the dose, كلما ارتفعت هاي the effects. One thing I want you to see is how narrow the uh, therapeutic index is for barbiturates. So, for example, barbiturates are used for sedation. تمام? The sedation dose is right here. It is right over here. تمام? بينما, if we increase the dose just a little bit, بس لو شلناها لهون, زحناها على اليمين, لهون, you can see إنه we go up very close to depression of the respiration and almost towards death. So there is a very, very narrow therapeutic index of the barbiturates. Well, the second way we're going to talk about the therapeutic index more extensively. Whereas benzodiazepines, on the other hand, you can see in the dose required for sedation, for example, let's say in the here, is very, very far away from the dose required for death. يعني في كثير عنا مسافة هون ما بين الدوز تبعت السيديشن والدوز تبعت الدث and this means that this is a very safe drug because the chance of overdose is very low على عكس الباربيتشورتس where the chance of overdose is very high so again this is a chart showing us the comparison of the therapeutic index for multiple drugs here on the y-axis we have the multiple drugs and on the x-axis we have the therapeutic index. Just to remind you, the therapeutic index is a ratio of the lethal dose to the effective dose. The lethal dose is the amount of drugs that is required to kill the patient and the effective dose is the amount of drugs that is required to treat the patient. تمام؟ ف when we divide these two numbers on each other, we get a number that tells us how far the lethal dose is from the effective dose. يعني لو كان ال therapeutic index رقم قليل زي مثلاً خمسة أو أربعة, this means إنه the lethal dose and the effective dose are very close to each other, very close to each other, which means إنه the drug is very unsafe. لأنه لو ال patient لا سمح الله زاد شوي الجرعة, they will go into lethal effects. تمام؟ بينما لو كان الرقم كثير كبير خلينا نقول مثلا 1000 على سبيل المثال This is a very safe drug لأنه now the patient will have to increase the dose a huge amount in order to actually suffer lethal effects يعني they have to do it on purpose باختصار in order to suffer lethal effects مش زي تبعت ال narrow therapeutic index where even a small increase in the, uh, the, the dose will lead to lethal effects but this is basically how we interpret the therapeutic index 
Here we have multiple drugs. Or if we have diazepam, which is a benzodiazepine, we can see in the therapeutic index is 1,000, a huge therapeutic index, which makes benzodiazepines generally very safe. Which means you know the chance of overdose is low compared to something like phenobarbital. Phenobarbital is an example of a barbiturate drug, and you can see that the therapeutic index is somewhere around 50. تمام? When you compare 50 with 1000, you can very clearly see why we discontinued barbiturates because they are much, much more dangerous than benzodiazepines. This is a huge difference in safety. So that's why we now use benzodiazepines instead of phenobarbital or يعني, other barbiturates. Here we also have a chlorpromazine, which um, I'm not sure what it is to be honest. And here we have morphine, which is an opioid, very low therapeutic index, almost 10. So yeah, that's that's fun. So yeah, benzodiazepines are relatively safe because the lethal dose is over 1,000 fold greater than the typical therapeutic dose. Yani, in order for the patient to suffer lethal effects, they would have to take 1,000 times the normal or the effective dose. So this is why they are extremely, extremely safe. Okay. Let's take some examples of barbiturates. Just like we did in the benzodiazepines here, we classify them based on their duration of action. We have the long-acting barbiturates like phenobarbital. Uh, this is used as an anti-convulsant. Uh, the long-acting benzodiazepines. We use them as the anti-convulsants. Here is the same Long-acting phenobarbitals or long-acting barbiturates sorry, are used as anti-convulsants. In general, we prefer to use long-acting drugs for the management of seizures and epilepsy. So, uh, on benzodiazepines or barbiturates. Here we have alphenobarbital. Uh, this is used as an anti-convulsant. It is a second-line agent in status epilepticus after the failure of benzodiazepines. So we no longer use barbiturates, but we still we still uh, make them nowadays as a last option. يعني أخير. So, for example, if a patient, if we try to manage an epilepsy patient by using benzodiazepines and they fail, they're not responding to treatment, we have to look for a second line agent, say, phenobarbital, for example. Here we can see phenobarbital tablets, and yeah. Um, then we have the intermediate acting barbiturates. This includes things like pentobarbital, for example, which we can see right over here. And this is usually used as a sedative hypnotic, so it's used to sedate or calm down the patient or you know, put them to sleep. And short-acting barbiturates include thiopental, and this is usually used in the induction of anesthesia. Very similar to benzodiazepines. Short-acting benzodiazepines are used in the induction of anesthesia and in the conscious sedation. So, kind of similar, yani. Okay. Now we move to a, a very nice class of drugs, the third class of uh, sedative hypnotic anxiolytics, what we call the Z-class drugs or the non-benzodiazepines. And we will see now why we call them non-benzodiazepines. Uh, by the way, they are called Z-class and all of, all of their names start with the letter Z, as we will see now. So they are called non-benzodiazepines because they have the same mechanism of action as benzodiazepines. Walakin, they selectively bind to GABA receptors with alpha-1 subunits. Has, uh, I put this in red, and this is not in our يعني, Dr. Mashraha, but I put it just so we can understand later points. They selectively bind to the GABA receptors with alpha-1 subunits. We talked about GABA receptors they have two alpha subunits, two beta subunits, and one gamma subunit. صح؟ تمام. هسا these alpha subunits, they can be multiple things. They can be alpha 1, they can be alpha 2, they can be alpha 3, etc. ف when the GABA receptor specifically has alpha subunits, then this GABA receptor is used in the neurons for the regulation of sleep. Which means, you know, because the Z-class, or the non-benzodiazepines, they selectively bind to GABA receptors with alpha subunits, alpha-1 subunits only, this means, you know, they are specifically targeted for insomnia, and they only act as hypnotics, and they don't work as anxiolytics. You know, they don't have an anxiolytic effect. For these drugs are strictly hypnotics, they don't have anxiolytic effects. ما بنستخدمهم بعلاج القلق ليش لانه they selectively bind to the alpha 1 subunits in the gaba receptors وهذول الالفا 1 subunits uh, they have a very important function in regulating sleep 
تمام other alpha subunits like alpha 2 and alpha 3 are used in the uh, anxiety فعشان هيك الأدوية زي البنزودياسبينز for example they can actually uh, bind to GABA receptors with alpha 2 and alpha 3 for that's how they can be anxiolytic in the Z class they only bind to the alpha 1 subunits of GABA receptors which means you know, they can only act as hypnotics again هذا اللي بالأحمر مو علينا I just put it so we can understand why the Z class are strictly hypnotics and not anxiolytics and sedatives تمام فيعني باختصار the Z class are sleeping pills sleeping pills بنستخدمه فقط للنوم عقاقير نوم فقط they're not used for anxiety or sedation Uh, they are the most commonly prescribed sleeping pills in the United States. Very, very common. Uh, they're safer than benzodiazepines. They have a shorter duration of action. And they have a lower chance of rebound insomnia than benzodiazepines. فبشكل عام, they are better used for the management of insomnia than benzodiazepines. And they're also very efficacious. يعني, they work very well. So let's talk about some Z-class drugs. The first one is called Zolpidem. زي ما شايفين, we start with the letter Z. That's why we call them Z-class. Uh, Zolpidem is the prototype, يعني هو ممثل هاي الكلاس. And it's also called Ambien. This is the, uh, what the bottle looks like. Uh, there's also Zaleplon, which is also called Sonata. We can see it over here. And there's also S-Zopiclon, which is also called Lunesta. So yeah, these are what these drugs look like, sleeping pills, زي ما حكينا, and uh, most of them start with the letter Z. They have a rapid onset of action, they have a short half-life as well. زي ما حكينا قبل شوي, they have a shorter duration of action, so they also have a shorter half-life, obviously, between 2 to 3 hours compared to benzodiazepines. Uh, they decrease sleep latency only. The way that they work is by decreasing sleep latency, meaning that patients will take less time to fall asleep. Best, they don't affect the sleep stages. They have no effect on the sleep stages. على عكس البنزودياسبينز, which increase the duration of the stage two of the non-REM sleep. تمام. Uh, they have multiple drugs of administration. Well, like in most of the time, we use them as oral drugs. Uh, patient بيأخذهم قبل ما ينام يعني. And yeah. So, what are the side effects of these Z drugs? First of all, impaired performance and cognition in the morning. Just like most sleeping pills, the patients, when, when they wake up, they're going to be a little bit sedated or groggy. Their cognitive uh, performance is going to be a little low. So, these patients have to be careful when driving in the morning or, you know, they can uh, have someone else drive them to where they want to be. That's better, yani, that's safer. And they could cause dependence. So even though they have a lower chance of dependence than benzodiazepines, there's still a chance, you know, there's still a chance. Uh, now, note here that the overdose on the Z drugs, we still use flumazenil. Yani if a patient overdoses on Z drugs, we also use flumazenil. نفس الانتيدوت اللي استخدمناه بالبنزودياسبين overdose. Which makes sense, لانو Z drugs, they bind at the same site as benzodiazepines. So we're going to use the same antidote, اللي هو flumazenil, which we can see here in this nice bottle, or vial. Okay. Now we continue to the over-the-counter sleep aid. So over-the-counter means that you don't need a prescription to get these medications. You can just get them from any pharmacy without a prescription. These are sometimes used by people without the uh, knowledge of their doctors. يعني بس بسمع مثلا من قريبه إنه والله خبك هالحبة بتنعس وإذا مش عارف تنام يعني. But these are over-the-counter sleep aids. The first one is Remelteon. Now, a quick word about Remelteon. The doctor said that this is an over-the-counter medication. Well, like in multiple sources that I have checked, including the website Medical News Today, says that Remelteon is actually a prescription medication. So you can't get it without a prescription. Well, like in the doctor had it with over-the-counter sleep aids. So again, I'm going to ask the doctor about this, and I will update you guys in the description box. So Remelteon, the way that it works is it is a melatonin agonist. If you guys know what melatonin is, it is the hormone produced by the pineal gland. And this is the hormone that regulates our sleep cycle. It starts getting produced when, the, uh, when it gets dark outside. So for example, around sunset. And this is when the uh, synthesis of melatonin increases. And as the levels of melatonin increase, we start to become more and more sleepy until we eventually fall asleep. And not the uh, shisma. <clears throat> the peak concentration of melatonin is between 12 a.m. and 8 a.m. And he between a bnusalil when we are deep asleep. This is when we have the peak concentration of melatonin. The way that Remelteon works 
is it's a melatonin agonist. It binds to the same receptors as melatonin and it activates those receptors. So it's an agonist for melatonin receptors. And there are two types, melatonin 1 and melatonin 2 receptors. It basically binds to both of these. Tamam? Uh, it's a very safe drug. Uh, there's no tolerance or dependence generally. Yani, again, it's uh, generally safer than other alternatives. It's usually taken 30 minutes before bed. And it's a pretty common drug used in the treatment of short-term insomnia. For example, واحد بدو يعدل جدول نومه. Or for example, jet lag. اللي هو بيكون بيكون مسافر ما بين مناطق بعيدة. And uh, بيكون, there's a disruption of the sleep cycle because of different time zones. But this is useful in the Ramaltion in these situations. Uh, they decrease sleep latency, this is how they work. And the side effects of Ramaltion is that they cause dizziness, fatigue, and somnolence. Dizziness is the dukha, fatigue is the tab, somnolence is the nom or nuas, which is you know expected of a sleep aid. And this is what it looks like, it's called Rosarim. So this is what it looks like. Okay. Now we move on to the uh, second over-the-counter sleep aid, which is the first generation antihistamines. So antihistamines are those allergy medications. We use them for allergies because, you know, they are basically antagonists for histamine receptors. So they help patients overcome their allergies that are especially aggravated by histamine that cause the symptoms like itching or coughing or sneezing. But they are useful in this kind of thing. Well, I can, they are also, they, so somehow, they have a uh, hypnotic effect. They cause, uh, they cause uh, drowsiness. But that's why they're usually taken as sleep aids. Uh, they're usually taken for mild insomnia. Uh, and the, the prototype, the most important example, is diphenhydramine, or so-called Benadryl. We can see it right over here. Even the book is called allergy. But this is just to remind you, these are actually allergy medications. But well, they are also taken in the setting of mild insomnia. Uh, this is diphenhydramine hydrochloride. It's written right over here. And uh, by the way, the Panadol night, which a lot of people use to fall asleep uh, on certain nights, actually contains diphenhydramine. This is the active ingredient that causes the sleepiness or the drowsiness. You can see it right over here, diphenhydramine, uh, along with the paracetamol, of course. And also we have el chlorphenamine or el alerfin. This is another allergy medication that is taken as a sleep aid. It's also an antihistamine. Hyo chlorphenamine, maliate, uh, alerfin. Moving on to the third over-the-counter sleep aid. Now, this isn't exactly uh, over-the-counter, nor is it a sleep aid. I know you're not going to find alcohol sold in pharmacies. And also people, it doesn't exactly, uh, it's not prescribed by the physicians. For, the reason it's put here is because some patients can use alcohol uh, to produce anxiolysis or sedation. This is very common. Uh, this is actually how people become dependent on alcohol, is that they already have something going on in their lives, and this kind of pain causes them to uh, overuse alcohol in this sense. So obviously, it's not prescribed by a physician. It can produce anxiolysis and sedation. It sometimes can make people sleepy. Uh, one thing to note here, and uh, this is something the doctor mentioned in the lecture, is something about disulfiram. So disulfiram is a drug that is used by alcoholic patients in order to help them quit alcohol. The way it works is that disulfiram inhibits a specific enzyme called aldehyde dehydrogenase or ALDH. How does that help? Aldehyde dehydrogenase is an important enzyme in the metabolism of alcohol. So when the patient is taking disulfiram, they will be inhibiting this enzyme necessary for the metabolism of alcohol. This means in no, when the patient tries to drink alcohol while they are on disulfiram, the alcohol is not going to be metabolized, which means you know, there is going to be immediate, very severe symptoms of hangover. Has a manal hangover is basically the severe symptoms that a patient experiences in the morning after a night out of drinking. But you see a lot in the films that he will be, for example, one comes to drink with his friends in the morning, and then they are experiencing a hangover. He will be having symptoms such as nausea, vomiting, dizziness, headache, discomfort. All this is because of alcohol. They feel it in the morning, after the night of drinking. 
Now, when the patient takes alcohol while they are on disulfiram, they will immediately experience an intense hangover symptoms such as these. فهذا إشي بيعتبر رادع عن شرب الكحول لأنه البيشنت بيعرف إنه لو شرب رح يصير فيه هاي السيمتومز. تمام؟ Another sorry, another drug that is used for quitting alcohol and is used in the treatment of alcohol use disorder is naltrexone. Naltrexone is actually an opioid receptor antagonist, and it's used in the treatment of opioid addiction because it's an antagonist. ولكن it's also the drug of choice for alcohol use disorder. يعني also بتساعد ال patients اللي بيكون عندهم abuse للكحول. ف... yeah, it's, uh, it's actually the drug of choice. The, the good thing about it is that it doesn't cause the intense hangover symptoms of uh, disulfiram, but it only suppresses the euphoria and the pleasure from alcohol. The يعني patient will drink without any feeling of euphoria, without any feeling of pleasure, so this is what will prevent them from drinking alcohol, because they know that they will not be able to do it. So this is again a useful drug for this kind of thing. And we reached the end of this presentation. I hope you guys enjoyed this lecture. Uh, if you have any questions, please let me know. Uh, you guys, my, uh, I'm going to put my Facebook in the description, inshallah. If you have any questions, hit me up. And peace.